Hi, and welcome to another video about probability theory, the logic of science by Edwin Jaynes. This video is going to cover chapter four, elementary hypothesis testing, but only up to binary hypothesis testing, which is section 4.2 of the book. Um, and the reason that I think it's, it's a good idea to break up this chapter into um, two lectures is that, um, first of all, it's, it's quite a lengthy chapter and it covers a lot of ideas. But also, I think it's, it's in really a lot of ways the, um, the most pivotal chapter of the book, and it's, it's the culmination of all the things that we've been um, kind of building up to this point. And it also uh, serves as a good example of all the reasoning that's going to take place in the rest of the book. So it's really good to just take our time with it and really kind of understand um, each step along the way. Um, and and um, so that this week we'll cover about the first half of it, next week our next video, we'll try to get to um, the second half of it. Okay, so we'll start with um, the way that we usually start, which is with the product rule. Um, and I'm just going to write it in a little bit more suggestive notation this time to emphasize some of the terms that we're going to be discussing um, with hypothesis testing. So let's just start um, on this side of it. Okay, I'll write h given d and x, um, p of d and x, that's going to be probability of h and d given x, and I'll say that that's equal to the probability of um, d given h and x, probability of h given x. Okay, so this is nothing more than the product rule um, with different uh, choices of letters. And now I'll actually um, go ahead and um, solve um, for the equation, solve the equation for one of the terms in it, which is on the left-hand side. So the main kind of form of this, is, as we've kind of seen it before, is to take this, these two equivalent formulations of this product rule expression and use them to solve for one of the, uh, the three out of the four terms in the equation. So if we do that, we can say that it's equal to, on the right-hand side, we'll put P of probability of H given X, and then the ratio probability of um, d given h and x probability divided by probability um, of d given x. Okay, so all I've done is taken this term here, divided it through to the right-hand side of the equation, and written um, probability of h given d and x. Um, and now we're going to actually start associating some names to these terms and understand why it is that we care about the product rule written in this way. Okay, so um, first of all, D is going to be our observed data, okay? H is going to be some working hypothesis for what might be causing those data, generating those data, and X is going to be kind of everything else in the form of our background information. Okay, so we talked about this, I think, a couple times ago, that um, one of the uh, really important formulations of the product rule, writing things in this way, is what's going to uh, allow us to do statistical inference, essentially. So when we have some data, and we can understand kind of how likely that data is given some working hypothesis or some guess as to, to what might be going on behind the scenes, and we compare that to with how likely that data is unconditional on that hypothesis, so just as a matter of um, observation, that ratio of those two numbers updates our probability assignment for the hypothesis being true to now what's called um, our, posterior hypo our posterior probability for the hypothesis. Okay, so again, just put some formal names on this. This one is called the posterior probability. Uh, this, ner this term is usually called the prior. Okay, and um, these terms here um, have various names. Uh, the one we used last time was, was the sampling probability or sampling distribution. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute or two. And the whole essence of this equation is that it expresses how we do inference based on um, these relative probabilities. Okay, so we talked about that with the example of the, the weak syllogism. Um, the big question then, and where most of every probability problem is going to reside 
is in thinking about what goes in here. All right, what is X um, and what are its consequences? Okay, so um, most people who've done probability are, are probably familiar with this idea or at least this equation um, for particular examples in what's called conditional probability. For us, all probability is conditional probability. So the big question is just, what is it conditional on? And as, as James describes, and as I think we'll see in many of the um, examples we do from here on out, the, the hardest thing in any probability problem is going to be translating the words of the problem, the statement of the problem, into some cogent assumptions x, and, and really um, being explicit about what their consequences are. Um, so um, there, there may not be in a certain, you know, given the problem, depending on how it's phrased, there may not be a unique way to do that. And James describes a, a few different strategies that he's going to lay out um, as we go on. And ambiguities of language being what they are, it may just be that, you know, sometimes it's not going to be clear. Um, for the examples we're going to talk about today, you know, hopefully most of the ones we'll get to, um, it should be clear. But I think the point of this equation that, that we should be understanding is that it's necessary. Right, so most people, um, when they when they've studied probability, um, at least in, in the orthodox schools, have kind of gotten um, off the tracks at some point here in, in refusing to assign things like this probability because they don't recognize the um, existence or the necessity of this conditioning information X. But I think James makes the really essential point that all probabilities are conditional on something, and it is incumbent on us to understand what that something is and, and to try to be as explicit about it as we can. Okay, so that's where we're going to start. And so the question today is, how do we calculate this thing given maybe ways of calculating these other things? Okay, the denominator term here is going to be particularly hard to get a handle on um, unless we have some other understanding of ways that the data could come about. Okay, so if we just think about um, how would we go about computing the probability of an observed set of data conditional on whatever background assumption um, we assume that we're loading the robot up with. Okay, so that's another thing that I think will become clear as we do some problems, that these x um, hypotheses, or these, these assumptions that are embedded in this background information x, may not actually be things that we kind of unconditionally believe to be true. They may just be things that we assume are true for the sake of doing the problem. Because okay, so they may only be kind of locally true to that problem, um, when we do a real exercise in uh, statistical inference or, or scientific inference, this is really going to be every other thing that we kind of bring to the, to the problem at hand, including all of the assumptions that we think are true and, and what we think um, is going on and how we think the world works. Okay, so um, given all that, big question is, all right, so now how do we compute things like the probability of getting some data? And one strategy we can imagine employing, right, which we've already hinted at, I think, once or twice, is to decompose this um, as uh, a sum involving the hypothesis and its complement, or, or the, the knot of it. So the way that that basically works formally is that we'll say that any statement is the same as its um, and with uh, an unconditionally true statement or a certain statement, um, which would be um, for example, something like the hypothesis or its negation, that's, that's always true, no matter the truth value of h. So it doesn't change anything logically to say, all right, data and this thing that's a tautology, um, conditional on x, right? So far, so good. Now we can actually write that using distributive properties of just logical assignments or, or logical rules. So we can say that that's the same as d and h or d and not h, okay, given x. Again, that's true um, just as logical statements, so they have to have the same probability assignments. Then according to our um, generalized sum rule that we talked about um, a couple times ago, we could imagine then breaking up this sum into probability of first term conditional on x plus the probability of the second term conditional on x and then we have this minus term, which is the probability of both of them, okay, dh, dh bar, conditional on x. Remember, that was our general form of the sum rule. But of course, if we think about what's going on in here, we have the statement d and 
hypothesis and D and H bar. Okay, so we can rewrite this in a different order. We can put just D and H and H bar, right? Which, if we either kind of just think about it for a second or jump straight to it, we can write that as D conditional on this H, H bar and X, probability of H, H bar conditional on X. And now we see that this H, H bar is an impossible statement, so it's got to have probability zero, right? It can't be true that the hypothesis and its negation are, are true at the same time. So actually this whole term drops out and we just get this sum. Okay. So far, so good. So the point is that we can decompose any probability, really for any statement we want, including um, the statement about this data, into two and probabilities um, involving a hypothesis and its negation. And then we could actually attack each one of those conditionally. So we could say this is probability of D given H and X, probability of H given X, plus probability of D given H bar and X, probability of H bar given x. Okay, so that's how we can go about computing this probability of d given x, which is in the denominator term here. And again, I think the general kind of lesson to draw from this is that it doesn't really even make sense to start talking about this probability of d given x unless we also have some understanding of other hypotheses that might be out there and what the associated probability conditional on those hypotheses would be. Okay, so really this term here is going to be the hard part. Well, and, and this one as well. Okay, so we have to know both things like under some alternate hypothesis, what would the sampling probability of the data be? And we also need to know what the prior probability associated to that hypothesis would be. Um, and Really, the, I think the, the point of this is that without those things, we can't really even begin to attack this problem of statistical inference. And so we really can't even begin to ask questions about whether this hypothesis is true or how much probability we assign to it. Right? So in some sense, you know, where you're allowed to break off bits of the background information and call them hypotheses for the purpose of testing really just depends on what else is le left and what alternatives there might be for the hypothesis piece and then how you can go about exploring um, their consequences and also the assigning their priors. Now, another thing to point out here that I think is, is just good for you to bear in mind if you want to think about this um, inference rule is that if you look at the two terms in this sum, you'll probably recognize the first one here as just the kind of combined numerator of this fraction on the right-hand side over uh, on the top equation. And the second term would be the same kind of thing you'd get for testing uh, the negation of the hypothesis. So another way of saying this whole thing is that the inferential um, probability of the hypothesis being true given the data is just the kind of relative proportion of this term in the equation um, relative to the, to the total sum. Okay, so if we divide through by the total here and express these two as ratios of the total, on um, the first term here is just what you see on the right hand over here. So it's the implied probability of the hypothesis. And the second term is the implied probability of its negation. So really, it's just kind of the, the relative sizes of these two things that determine our inferential rules, which is kind of as it, sh as it should be. OK. Um, so this is going to be basically our, our main conceptual rule for doing um, hypothesis testing, which is what we're going to talk about right now. Um, and in particular, we're going to consider a special case where this thing is something that we can work with, we can consider. Okay, so um, again, in many problems, it's going to be pretty clear how to think through this conditional probability given a hypothesis. Just conditioning on its negation is going to be something more nebulous and a little bit less well defined. Um, but if we can specifically lay out what the negation of the hypothesis is, then maybe we can attack this and we can break it down. And that's what's going to be um, uh, the, the rule for doing a binary hypothesis test. So we'll, we'll get into that just now. Okay. So how does this work? Well, what we're going to assume is that um, this probability of data conditional on the negation of the hypothesis is somehow 
um, easy to compute. Right? And the way it's going to be easy to compute is it will actually be able to specify exactly what the negation of the hypothesis is. Um, before we get into an example of that, let's just see kind of what we, what we could do if we had that um, negation. So we've said this already, but let's imagine that we were testing uh, the negation of the hypothesis. So that means we're looking at things like probability of h bar given the data, how, um, how much probability do we assign to that. And we know that it's the same rule as we had before. Okay, so it's probability of um, d given h bar divided by probability d given x. Okay, so exactly what we said before, but with h bar instead of h. And now the kind of interesting or handy trick that we could do is divide this equation by this equation and we get a little bit of cancellation. It just kind of makes things a little, a little bit nicer. Okay, so if we do that, divide this um, first equation by the second equation. On the left-hand side, we're going to have this term. And on the right-hand side, we're going to have the ratio of probabilities for h and h bar. Okay, and then times d given h um, and x divided by this thing, that's going to cancel that, and we have d given h bar. So we have probability of d given h and x divided by probability of d given h bar and x. Okay, and the probability of d cancels. Now again, that hasn't really bought us anything because if we had all these terms, we already sort of um, have written out exactly how we would compute probability of d, so we're not really getting anything for free. But it happens to make it um, expressible in this nice way where um, if we, let's say, um, make another definition, which is that if we call this ratio of the probability of something to the probability of its negation, let's call that um, the odds um, of it. And on the right-hand side, again, we have a, a probability like that, so we have probability of something divided by probability of its negation. That's um, going to be an odds, and we'll call that one the prior odds. And we'll call this one the posterior odds. Okay, and then what this equation is just saying is that our posterior odds for this hypothesis equals the prior odds times some ratio, right, which is the ratio of how likely the data is given the hypothesis to how likely it is given the hypothesis negation. Okay, so this is what's going to be called the likelihood ratio. And again, it just tells us basically how to update our probability assignments given the observation of some data. Okay, and all that really matters is how is the comparison of how likely the data is given h versus how likely it is given h bar. Now, why is it um, convenient to put things on this scale? Well, we'll see that in a bit, um, bit more, but um, just to kind of um, write it down. So whenever we say odds, what we mean is um, the probability divided by 1 minus the probability, and that's what you have in things like this. So probability of negation is always going to be 1 minus the probability, um, and the odds we're saying is p over 1 minus p. And one thing that might remind you of is um, odds in gambling games, right? So this is going to be basically the number that would be the fair odds for a gambling game with success probability p. Um, if you wanted to have expected value equal to 1 or equal to the starting amount. So that's, a, that's just basically where that's coming from. And actually, what Jaynes does is goes um, one step further, which is to take the log of both sides of this equation, because basically instead of multiplying things, we'd rather be adding them. Okay, so that's what's going to um, come next. So if we then take, let's say, the log of these probabilities, and let's just go ahead and call this thing O of H, so that O is, again, the odds, the ratio of the probability to its negation. Um, that's going to be the log of the odds of H given X, plus now the log of this ratio of probabilities. H bar and X, okay, bracket, bracket. Um, and now, actually, what we're going to do is, is uh, make this a little bit on a more convenient scale, which is to say, uh, let's just multiply everything by 10. Okay, and the reason that we multiply by 10 will become clear in a minute. Okay, but this number now, um, James calls the evidence. 
for the hypothesis um, and denotes it E of H given dx. Okay, so this is kind of the posterior evidence and then this number is the prior evidence. Okay, and these are logs base 10. I didn't say that, but um, the reason why it's convenient to do things on a log base 10 scale is basically because we can then think about things in terms of powers of 10. Okay, so if we just kind of write out a few examples of these um, odds and um, evidence, uh, which is now measured in what's called decibels, okay, I think it'll be clear kind of how the pattern works. So um, James gives a little bit of a table of this, but I'll just reproduce some of it here. So if we have, let's say, the evidence, the odds, and the probability, well, first of all, an odds of one, we said is um, the fair odds of uh, a game. So in order to have fair odds of one, it would have to be a probability of one half, right? So you can kind of see that here, one half divided by one minus one half is one. Um, the log of that is zero. So evidence for a fair game is zero. Um, the odds of, let's say, um, we got an odds of two to one, then that's a probability of two thirds, and that is an evidence of about three. Okay, so as usual with decibels, when we increase by three, we about double the odds. And you can see that based on um, the log base 10 of two. And an odds of, let's say, 10 would correspond to a probability of 10 out of 11, um, which would be an evidence of uh, 10. So basically what happens is every time we go up by 10 from here on, we multiply our odds. Um, multiply, every time we go up by 10 in evidence, we multiply our odds by 10. Right? That's what this, this factor of 10 is doing here and the log is here. So if we go up to, let's say, 20, we're going to have odds of 100, which is a probability of 100 divided by 101, so about 0.99 roughly. Um, and similarly on down the line, so if we go up to, let's say, 10n, that's going to be odds of 10 to the n to 1 in favor, um, which is a probability of that thing divided by it plus 1, but that's about equal to 1 minus 10 to the minus n. Okay, and the whole reason for this scale and kind of what makes this convenient is that we're going to want to talk about um, events with probabilities way down in, in this range or in the other range. Okay, so if we go to the negative um, scale, if we say reverse the evidence, that's just going to be basically taking the reciprocal of the odds, right, according to the log rule. Um, so it's going to be whatever we had before um, the reciprocal of it, and in terms of probabilities, it's just going to be giving us the one minus probability, the probability of the negation. Okay. So if we're interested in events with probabilities like 0.99999 versus 0.9999999, right? In ordinary language, um, those, the difference between those two things is kind of hard to express because you have to have all these nines. Or if you take their um, inverses, it would be you know, 0.0000, some number of zeros, and then one. And the decibel scale just kind of makes that in, in a more convenient way. Um, uh, system of units. So we can say, all right, it's, it's 20 decibels, meaning 100 to 1 in favor, or a probability of about um, 0.99, or it's 30 decibels, which increases the um, odds by a factor of 10, right, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, James kind of makes the claim that after you kind of learn to think in this scale, you'll understand and appreciate the differences between um, evidences of, say, 40 and 60 decibels, where you might not have been able to understand the difference between, you know, probabilities of um, 10 to the minus 4 and 10 to the minus 6. Okay. So anyway, this is the, the decibel scale for the evidence, right, which is kind of the log of the odds. And the whole point of this inferential rule in this particular example or in, under, you know, the assumption that we can actually compute these things is that we can update our um, posterior evidence as whatever our prior evidence was, plus some number that's going to depend on this ratio. Okay, so let's get into, uh, into this term just now. Okay. So what does that look like? Well, we're going to consider 
actually some more special cases, but these are going to turn out to be um, pretty, pretty general cases. So let's say we can write um, our data as some combination of observations over maybe many trials or um, multiple, let's say, information units. So we have D1 through, I don't know, DM, and our data is kind of the and of all of them taken together. Um, then what does this do for us? Well, things like what we have over here in the numerator, probability of our data, given some hypothesis, and again, our background information, um, we're always going to be able to write that in this kind of term. So we'll have probability of D1, right? Then we have the probability of D2 conditional on D1, okay, etc. So we're going to go all the way out to probability of Dm conditional on everything that came before it. That's just iterating our product rule, um, m times. Similarly, we'll have things like that for probability of D given the negative hypothesis. So it'll be like probability of D1 given h bar, um, probability of D2 given D1 and h bar. Sorry, there should have been and h x here. Okay, etc. Um, D1 given, uh, sorry, D2 given D1 and h bar and x. Okay, etc. So now when we start taking ratios of these, these two things, we're basically going to have the ratio of the two equations we just wrote. So we can do that. Um, and if we want to take the log of it, we'll have the log of that ratio, etc., etc. Okay. Um, one very important then class of special examples is going to come about when we assume that these numbers have nothing to do with these um, inner um, data assumptions. Okay, so this is going to be again, a very special case, but one that manages to come up over and over again, which is that if it's the case that the probability, let's say, of D2 given D1 and the hypothesis is equal to probability just of D2 unconditional in D1. Okay, so that kind of example, and similarly for every other pair, okay, so let's say and similarly for things like probability di given all d1 through di minus 1, okay, if that happens, then we're going to have some very nice um, factorization here, okay, so then it's going to happen that things like probability of, let's say, d given h and x, we're just going to be able to write that as a product of d1 times d2 times d3, etc., all the way up to uh, dm. Okay, hopefully you can kind of see that because we're just assuming that every conditional probability we have in here is just whatever it is, sort of unconditionally on all the rest of the data. Um, when this happens, we say that uh, this set of propositions is what's called independent. Okay. Um, and James doesn't really get too explicit about this, but I think it's, it's probably just worth understanding that this actually requires something more than just the propositions taken pairwise. In fact, it's, it's fairly strong. It says that um, things like the probability of the ith data uh, statement conditional on all the other ones um, has to be the same as its um, unconditional value. Okay, so it's not even just an, enough to have every pair. You actually have to have every kind of joint um, combination like this. And if you want to think about counterexamples, you could consider things like, you know, if we were flipping two coins and we believe that those were independent, our, our data propositions could be like, the first coin is a head, comes up heads, the second coin comes up heads, that could be D1, D2, and D3 could be exactly one of the other two was a head, and right? came up heads. So actually it turns out that pairwise those three statements are independent, meaning you can take any one of them and it doesn't actually affect your probability of one of the other ones, but given any two of them, the other one is determined. I'll leave that for you to kind of think through, but anyway, there's more going on here than just um, really what, what James gets into. The other assumption, though, that we're going to make is that not only is that true for 
probabilities based on this hypothesis, but it's also true for probabilities based on the negation. Okay, so if it's also true that these propositions are independent, I should say, are independent um, given h bar, right? So what we had up here was a statement about probabilities conditional on h, so really I should be saying conditional on h. If it's also true that they're, they're independent conditional on h bar, then we get the same factorization um, in the denominator here, so these terms are all going to be you know, equal to their unconditional values, and we're just going to have uh, the probability ratio on the left-hand side equaling um, a product um, of ratios, so I'll write in, in uh, capital pi notation, product of ratios of di given hx divided by um, di given h bar x. Okay, so this just means the product, right? Um, and if we take logs of it, we're going to get a sum. Okay, so this is kind of where we ultimately want to go, is to take the log of that number. So instead of the product, now we have a sum. Log of the product is the sum of the logs, and we have um, the sum of the logs over here. And that's going to continue to be true if we um, multiply both sides by 10. That doesn't change anything. Um, no big deal. All right, we have the sum i equals 1 to m. And this is the number that um, we wanted to compute over here on the right-hand side. So basically, all we need to be able to compute in order to do this um, probabilistic inference, this updating of probabilities, is each one of these um, probabilities of the ith bit of data both conditional on the hypothesis and on its negation. Okay, now that's all very abstract. We're about to do a concrete example. Hopefully we should make that um, more clear and put it in, in uh, some more clear terms. One thing I think that's, that's really important to just be aware of right now, um, and James uh, does a little bit of this in, um, in the next section, is that this assumption that um, the, the data propositions are independent given both the hypothesis and its negation um, is, is very difficult, right, um, in general to, to satisfy. And in particular, it's not generally going to be true if we start trying to break this down into instead of just the negation, but, act, but then, you know, more than one other possible proposition. Okay, when we get to multiple hypothesis testing, we're going to see this in detail. And actually, it's generally not going to be the case that statements that are independent on H are also then going to be independent on like H2 and H3 if those are the two propositions that make up um, the negation of H1. Okay, so we'll see that a bit more. But this is actually, you know, a fairly strong assumption. It really only applies to the case of binary hypothesis testing where we have some kind of explicit understanding of what the negative hypothesis is and how we can compute probability based on it. Okay, so let's actually do then the one example we can do, and, and hopefully that'll all kind of be clear um, where we get that independence and, and how we use it. Okay. So I probably shouldn't erase that. That's okay. Okay, so let me just write maybe up here the final inferential rule that we get for updating evidence based on a set of data. Okay, so that's going to be um, uh, this way. So let's we'll say the evidence of the hypothesis. Okay, that's again this log odds thing given the data is whatever prior evidence we associated to it. Okay, prior probabilities um, plus a sum which is going to be ten times the log of um, or sum of 10 times the log of this ratio of probabilities, probability of di given h to the probability of it conditional on h bar. Okay, so how likely are we to get the data given the hypothesis is true versus how likely are we to get the data versus the hypo um, conditional on the hypothesis being false? Um, take the log of that ratio, add them up, multiply by 10, and that gives us our way of updating our hypothesis evidence in this um, decibel scale from what it was um, previously to what it is now conditional on the data. Okay, so let's see how that plays out.
uh, in a real life example. Okay, so here's gonna, this is our example. Our background assumption X is gonna consist of the following information. We're gonna assume that we have 11 machines in a factory um, producing widgets, okay, whatever a widget is. Um, they are producing them and then pouring them into a set of boxes, uh, one box for each machine. Okay, but the boxes are unlabeled and otherwise completely indistinguishable from each other. Okay, so once they go into the boxes, uh, the boxes go um, into some back room of the warehouse and we can't tell anymore which box came from which machine. Um, 10 of these machines are gonna produce um, mostly good widgets. Okay, so they're gonna produce um, widgets that are defective only a sixth of the time, okay, or at a ratio of um, one sixth of them. And these are gonna be, um, we're gonna think of these as the good, the good batches or the good machines. The remaining machine is gonna produce widgets that are um, one third defective. Okay, so a third of those widgets are gonna be um, defective, and we'll call that the bad machine. Okay, we are gonna then choose a box. Again, one of these unlabeled boxes from wherever this back room is that they're being stored. Um, we're gonna sample from it. Um, we're gonna do that sampling without replacement. Okay, so the way that we I talked about in the last video where we were drawing balls from an urn and the balls had different colors. We're basically doing the same thing here, except now they're widgets and they are either good or bad or defective or not defective. Um, it's important to probably point out that this is the only kind of sampling probability that we know how to compute at this point. It's the only thing that we've um, really talked about is computing the probability conditional on some background information. So we sample without replacement. We, we could also do with replacement. We won't, we won't uh, think about that for now. Um, and then we test uh, whether they're good or bad. Okay, and this is gonna be our data. So our data is gonna be some sequence of um, goods and bads. Goods and bads, let's say. All right. Um, and I'm going to probably depart from James's notation here. Our hypothesis is going to be, right, so that's, that's our x, our data is sort of this sequence, whatever it is that we realize, and our hypothesis, h, is going to be that we chose uh, the bad batch. Okay, so that's kind of what we're interested in uh, for purposes of quality assurance. We want to know, all right, given this little sample we've, we've conducted, um, what can we conclude about whether we got the box that was from the defective machine or the one that was producing you know, a higher proportion of defective widgets? Okay, so let's just uh, fix some notation here just so we can kind of be clear what we're talking about. So let's let um, bad i be the statement that um, we got a bad widget on the ith draw. Okay, and good i is going to be that we got a good one. Okay, on the ith draw, just as you would expect. Okay, so let's start then thinking about how would we compute some of the terms in this equation, and then what probability do we associate to this hypothesis? Okay, so our, our main question is going to be, all right, what is the probability of our hypothesis given our data and our background assumptions? Okay, and here actually, you should note that we're not even really just solving one problem, we're actually kind of solving the whole class of problems where the data is any sequence that we choose it to be. So really, in, in principle, a problem would be, all right, fix a sequence of data and now answer this question of what's the probability of the hypothesis. We're gonna do them all simultaneously by saying, basically our data is some variable that can be either bad or good, so these guys can be either true or false um, on each for each i, and we're gonna ask the question, what is um, the probability of h conditional on whatever that sequence of data is? And the other thing I should point out here is that good 
i, right, by definition is the negation of bad i. Right, so any probabilities about for this um, statement are just going to be one minus the probabilities of the other one. Okay. So what are we able to say about it? Well, if we think back to uh, what we talked about last time with um, drawing balls from urns and the principle of indifference, what we said is when we don't have enough background information to distinguish between different propositions, we have to assign them equal probabilities by some kind of symmetry argument. Okay, so for starters, do we have um, any information in our sort of background assumptions X that would tell us anything about which machine we got um, the box from, or or really which box it was that we picked it up? We said we said explicitly they're unlabeled, and we said that we just um, chose a box. We didn't say according to any particular distinguishing characteristic. So we have to assign it um, the probability, um, the prior probability, which is just 1 over the number of boxes, or 111. Okay, so if we just translate that into our evidentiary scale, what does that work out to be? So the evidence, just based on nothing, is again 10 times the log of this prior probability, which is um, uh, 10 times the log of the odds, which is p over 1 minus p, or 10 times the log of um, 1 11th divided by 10 11th, which is the log of 1 10th, so that's minus 1. So we get minus 10 decibels for our prior evidence of the hypothesis, just given x. Then the next question is, what would be um, some of these probabilities that are sampling probabilities for getting particular data uh, given the hypothesis or given its, its negation. Okay, so um, let's say that if the first data um, element was a bad one, so we drew um, a bad widget on the first draw, what would we say about the probability of that? Okay, um, the probability of that given the hypothesis, right? The hypothesis is that we were working from the um, bad machine or the more defective machines. So the probability that we get a bad widget on the first draw is just one third, okay? Um, similarly, if, the, if uh, we were working from the um, good machine or the, one of the less defective machines, um, we would be um, drawing from a, a, a population that has uh, one-sixth defective, so we'd say that the probability of getting a bad one is one-sixth. Okay, we can then also work out things like the probability of a, of a good one. So let's say um, probability of a good one, given the hypothesis, well, it's just one minus that probability, so it's two-thirds, and the probability of a good one given this other hypothesis where we're working from in one of the good machines is 5 sixths. Okay, so at least we know how to compute, um, say, the first term on the right-hand side over here. Okay, so things like um, the ratio of these probabilities, um, so right here, probability d1 given h and x, um, if it's a bad one, let's say, divided by probability of d1 given h bar and x would be something like um, a third over a sixth. Okay, so that's two, and if we take the log of it, we're gonna have um, log of two, and we multiply by 10 to put it on our um, decibel scale, so it's gonna be 10 log two, which is about three decibels. Okay, and this is the whole point of the odds decibel scale, is that when we go up by three decibels, we about double um, the odds, um, which means that we are um, you know, changing probabilities this way. Okay, what about um, if it's a good one? Well, we'll basically say the same thing. So um, that, let's say the 10 log probability of a good one on the first draw, 
okay, ratio between the hypothesis and its negation is going to be like 10 log of um, the probability of the good one is two thirds, and the probability in, uh, sorry, probably the good one under the hypothesis is two thirds of a good one under the negative hypothesis is five sixths, right? So we end up um, with um, 10 times the log of two thirds over five sixths, which is 10 times the log of, see this is um, six, so that becomes four fifths, so 0.8, 10 times log of 0.8 is about uh, minus 0.97, um, which we'll just say is, is about equal to minus one. Okay, so let's call that minus one decibel. Okay, so basically we know from just doing that little calculation, if we only drew one widget out, uh, we could say exactly what our posterior um, evidence for the hypothesis is given the results of that one draw. So if it were um, a, a bad one, right, it would increase our um, evidence by three decibels right, that we were drawing from the bad box or from the bad batch, right? Three decibels on an initial place of minus 10 decibels. So we go from minus 10 to minus seven-ish. We're still not really very confident. We're certainly still more likely to be in the good one. Um, but if we drew a good one, we'd go from minus 10 down to minus 11. So we're even kind of further away. So we're more confident that we have a good batch. Okay, so now the big question is, what about probabilities of um, good and bad widgets on the subsequent draws. Okay, so let's think about probability of bad two, maybe given that we drew a, a bad one on the first draw, and again, this is all conditional on um, the hypothesis and on background information X. Well, we know from last time that when we do this sampling without replacement, right, conditional on having drawn say one of the special um, balls from the urn, one of the ones that were colored red, or in this case, one of the widgets that we are talking about that it's a bad widget. Um, conditional on having done that, the probability of drawing the next one is like m minus one over n minus one, okay, where m was the initial number of kind of special ones and n was the total number that we're drawing from. Okay, in this case, we made an assumption that Actually, m is a third n, right? So our, our hypothesis was that we are in this bad um, batch where a third of them are defective. So we know that this is kind of like n over 3 minus 1 over n minus 1. Okay, but now we're just going to make an approximation, which is that we're going to assume that n is large. Okay, assume is, n is very large. Um, in particular, large in comparison to the number of times that we're going to be doing this sample. Okay, so we assume these are very large boxes with maybe thousands and thousands of widgets in them, and we're only going to be drawing out a handful. So it doesn't appreciably change the probabilities um, on subsequent draws based on the result of the previous draw. Okay, so whatever this is, it's going to be this n minus one's not really doing anything relative to n. This is basically n, and this n over three is basically n over three, or n over three minus one is basically the same as n over three. So this is gonna be equal to one third. In fact, we're just gonna assert that it is one third. Okay, and that's just a consequence of assuming that we're in this kind of limiting case where n is very large. Okay, why that is actually then very important for us is that it makes it so that we satisfy this independence assumption that gets us to this equation. Okay, so what this does is it means that all of the draws from these boxes are independent from each other, or at least um, they're very close to being independent to the point where if we assume they're independent, it's a good approximation. Okay, and that's going to be true conditional on drawing from this bad box where a third of them are defective, and also conditional on drawing from one of these good boxes where only a six of them are defective. Okay, so we're basically assuming all of these boxes are very large and filled with many widgets, and we're not really materially affecting their probabilities based on which ones we draw out. Um, so we'll just assert that that makes it so that all of these data samples are independent, conditional on both the hypothesis and the, the negation of the hypothesis, okay? All right, so what does that then do for us? Well, basically what it means is that these probabilities we have here, 
Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and just write this as probability of a bad one, probability of a bad one, okay, conditional on the hypothesis, conditional on the alternate hypothesis, um, good one and good one. These things are going to be true for all i, right? meaning there, there are constant probabilities, um, and these um, statements are independent of each other. Right? So this same exact calculus we just did here for um, the way that our evidence gets updated based on the results of one draw is going to carry through to any draw. Okay, so everything we've said here, probability of uh, d1 is going to be the same for di, it's not going to matter, so it's just going to be um, a, a term that comes out to be about three decibels, and the same thing if we draw a good one, um, it's going to be a term about minus one decibel. Okay, so these are kind of going to be the key numbers. Okay, and I'll just write to be a little bit more explicit. This is, again, the probability, um, the way that our probabilities get updated when we have a bad draw and when we have a good draw. Okay, so it's 10 log of this is about three decibels. 10 log of this ratio is about minus one decibel. Okay, and that's going to be true on, on any draw we want. Okay, all right, so what do we get to? Well, it's kind of nice, actually. So basically we have now in this equation, right, this is what we're really interested in, our, our posterior um, evidence for the hypothesis given our data is our prior um, evidence for the hypothesis without the data, so minus 10, plus then a sum of however many um, bad draws we get and however many good draws we get times these factors. So we're basically going to have 3 times our number of bad draws minus our number of good draws. Okay, so nb is the number of bad and ng is the number good. And if we write that as, um, let's say we did n total, so n was the total number of draws of of bad plus good, um, we could say that this is actually minus 10 plus, um, let's say that's three number of bads minus um, n minus the number of bads, okay? Um, which then if we expand that out, we get minus 10 plus three um, number of bad um, minus, minus another one, so actually it becomes plus four and then minus n. And if we write, let's say, the bad fraction as the number of bad divided by n, um, what we should get is that this is minus 10 um, plus, um, let's see if I did that right, yep, n times 4 times the bad fraction minus 1. Okay, that's what I wanted. So there's several kind of interesting consequences um, to this. This is only kind of approximate because we made some approximations here um, that these, this number is about 3 and this number is about minus 1. Um, the true numbers are only off by that by a little bit. We also made an approximation about it, um, about the independence, okay, when we assume that n was large, but again, it's a pretty decent approximation. Um, and the point is, right, what does this number do as a function of n, assuming you know, this FB is kind of stabilizing to some fixed ratio, okay? So we're sampling from the same box every time. We kind of believe, at least from our um, sampling without replacement argument last time, that ultimately the fraction we realize um, kind of converges on um, or has the most likely value at the true ratio in that box. So we'll just sort of say that, okay, this is our kind of bad fraction we're going to realize over time. If that number is um, greater than a fourth, Okay, so greater than a quarter of the ones we draw out are bad widgets. Then this term here is positive, and then basically this thing just increases as n increases. Okay, so the more we sample, the higher this number gets, and the more confident that we get that the hypothesis is true. Okay, which should make sense, because again, the hypothesis is that we've got the bad box where the ratio is a third, and not one of the good boxes where the ratio is only a sixth. So a fourth somehow works out to be kind of the middle ground between a third and a sixth, where if we're drawing um, uh, bad widgets at that ratio or higher, 
eventually that accumulates to be enough evidence to where we can um, conclude with whatever certainty we want that we've got the bad box and not one of the good ones. Okay, conversely, if it's less than a fourth, then this number is negative and then this evidence is going to go down um, to whatever uh, negative evidence uh, we require. So basically whatever odds against um, we need. Okay, so that's a very elegant kind of example of a hypothesis test and really what makes it work, I think that the lesson to take away from it is that in this very particular um, example, we know both what the hypothesis is that we're interested in and we know um, very explicitly what its negation is and what the sampling distributions are conditional in each one of those. Okay, so if it's the hypothesis, then we know the sampling distribution basically is drawing from one urn um, without replacement, and if it's a negation, it's just basically another kind of urn, and we know everything we want to know about the sampling distributions for these drawing um, out of urns problems. Where this is going to get complicated is where this negation then maybe has more than one possibility embedded in it. Okay, so if it's the case that, you know, on not having this defective machine box or whatever it is, there are maybe more than one other uh, thing that could happen, then we're going to have to really think hard about how do we compute things like probabilities of getting some data um, conditional on that. Um, and what I think maybe should be suggestive here is to say, let's just imagine that we were doing this. Okay, James talks about this at the end of the chapter, but let's just imagine we're doing this not in this kind of idealized problem, but like we're doing this in the real world. So we're actually in a factory. We've actually got these boxes somewhere you know, in the back of the, the warehouse, and we're actually doing this sample and looking at how many of them are good and how many of them are bad. Okay, but let's imagine that actually we draw out a hundred and they're all bad, right? So we get bad, 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 bad like that for the first hundred widgets. Well, according to this evidentiary rule, that's, that's great for the hypothesis H. It tells us that, you know, our, um, our number of bad ones just goes up and up and up, right? Um, so as our, you know, as our sampling fraction goes, it's, uh, it's about one. So this um, total evidence just gets elevated to whatever um, high level we want it to be. And we end up, say, concluding things like we've got, you know, certainty to the degree of like odds of 10 to the 100th or, you know, a, a probability of one minus 10 to the uh, minus 100 that we're drawing from this bad box. However, intuitively, through common sense, we should have a problem with that because we know that that bad box is only supposed to have a third of them be bad, and yet we were drawing out a hundred bad ones in a row. We didn't see any good ones at all. All right, so basically the question is, what are we going to do with that information, and how do we interpret that? And this is really what's going to get us into multiple hypothesis testing, where we throw in maybe some other explanatory hypothesis that um, maybe one of the machines was just broken. Right? and it was producing all bad widgets, and we had one box that was just completely bad or 99% or bad or whatever it was. Um, and when we see these um, sort of data that is very, very unlikely, conditional on one of the hypotheses we have, it should allow us to kind of revive one of these alternate hypotheses to explain the data a little bit better than the one that we've, we've chosen. Okay, so again, this is, you know, all of this derivation here just carries through because we assume there's only these two possible cases but in real life, probably intuitively, we would have more than those two. Um, and that's what we're going to see next time. So because that's, that's one big class of questions. The other big class of questions is, all right, where do we set these values so that we would stop sampling or you know, actually reach a conclusion based on what we did observe? Okay, so this is going to be the substance of what's called decision theory. And the point here is that actually probability doesn't answer that question for us, right? Probability just tells us what these um, probability assignments should look like as a consequence of our assumptions, right? but it doesn't tell us at what point we are certain enough that we should stop testing or we should accept this as you know, a good or bad box or whatever it is. <coughs> so we're going to see that um, a bit later in the book, um, but um, basically you can, you can think about you know, setting maybe some limits of um, what would be called a type 1 or type 2 error, um, accepting you know, a false um, hypothesis or rejecting it when it's true, and then you could ask the question, all right, if we were in one of these scenarios, how would this evidence kind of behave as a random number over the, over the samples we did of it, and what would be the odds that we would um, kind of get to our um, 
sufficient criteria without having um, gotten to the other extreme of either rejecting it or accepting it falsely. Okay, so that's that's um, kind of a preview of everything that, that's uh, to come later on.